Okay, so thank you everybody for uh, joining. And I think we'll just begin and whoever wants to uh, join may do so. Uh, thank you, Christopher and everyone else who helped and people who made the effort, hi Fernanda, to come to Samba Wang. I know it's not, not easy. And uh, thank you people who are watching from home, people in Israel, people who will join, many others uh, that could not make it physically, but they are connected now to Facebook. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here, share with you this project, very meaningful project that I'm going to talk about. And uh, as you're going to see, I have many question marks. So I'm going to share a lot, but there, there's a lot still to be found, a lot still missing. Uh, and I want to share with you the preliminary results. Um, so this is me, a bit about myself. Morty, daddy of Oli, five years old, K1. We're SMMIS people. And Danny, yeah. Yes, and uh, Danny, pre-nursery, two years old, my wife, Tal, and what I regularly do, I'm not a Singapore Geniza person. In my real life, I write a PhD at Ben Gurion University about uh, the interactions between Kabbalah and political ideology in contemporary Israel. But I do find myself more and more invested in this project that I'm going to share with you. I was born in Jerusalem, in an Orthodox home, and I was always been drawn to books. My parents' living room was full with books, hundreds and hundreds of books. And always when I used to join my father to shul, to synagogue, I was always attracted to the books and behind. People would daven, would pray, and I would go and look at the books. Are there any books that I don't know of? And until this very day, if I can spot a book on the other side of the room that's upside down, I'm going to forget about everything and get to that book to bring it back to order, right? To, to flip it uh, back. And I want to uh, share this because now you can understand how excited I was when here in Singapore, I was in the shul, the synagogue of Chesedel, and I all of a sudden saw an old book. A book from 1850, and as we know, the first Jews came to Singapore about that time. Already in the 40s of the 19th century, there was a community here, and then a second wave, 1870. And these Jews, what do we know about them? So, actually there is research that was done, and mainly it was done on the economic or sociological aspects. But the religious and cultural, all of these aspects were not yet discussed in research. Now, we have an opportunity. I realized that these books that the Jews, the first Jews of Singapore brought with them, are a gate to their spiritual life, to their spiritual world. And then I went to Magena Vot, but I thought there's only this one book. So I went to the Magena Vot synagogue, and there I saw another book. And I said, wait a minute, maybe there are others. Where are the books? I went to the rabbi, and I said, Rabbi, are there any other books? He said, uh, yes. Where are they? He said, you can find out. You are, from now on, the in you're in charge. You're the head of the project. And I, I was speaking to members of the community, and they were telling me, yes, we know of other books. And there were rumors about maybe a hidden room under the ground, an underground hidden room with thousands of books. There was, and people were speaking about this Geniza, books that Jews left behind. They, they passed away, but the books remained. Where are these books? So Rabbi uh, uh, called his son, Yossi, that's here, and uh, he said, Yossi, you have a new job. You're Morty's assistant. And together we looked for the books. And we found them. We found them under staircases. We found them uh, in bookshelves, under bookshelves, in the personal uh, 
uh, seats that people sit in scattered all over, and sometimes in very unpredictable places, and some were in very bad condition. We're going to talk about this later. And we were gathering and gathering the books. Okay, this is from, the, from, from gathering, you can see. Um, and these, I want to remind you, are only the books from Magen Avot. There are many others in the other synagogue, Chesedeh. And until now, we still didn't get there. Okay, so there's going to be, I'm already giving you a spoiler, there's going to be another lecture at the Jacob Ballas Center, January 18th. I'll write it down. Uh, and then we're going to speak also about the findings from the Chesedeh synagogue. So we see more and more books. We're putting them in boxes. We're collecting them. We're bringing them together. And this is, I can't explain how exciting this is. Because this is the first time that people are putting these hands on these books after they, some of them are nearly 200 years old. They were brought here, and we want to find out about the life of the books. Because the books are living entities. Books have so much richness. There is a whole field today called history of the book, meaning that every book, every book has a history. You can learn so much from a book. It's unbelievable, and this is things that I'm experiencing myself these days. And we're collecting the books. Sometimes we discover that books that seem old aren't that old, and vice versa, because some books are redone, right, over the years. And then I'm asking myself questions. I want to approach the books and ask questions about the books that I'm, uh, that I'm approaching. One, what's the name of the book? What year was the book printed in? Where in the world was the book printed? Why there? Who's the person who brought the book to print? Who's the person who printed the book, the, the, the printing house? Does the book bear any handwriting, inscriptions, stamps, signatures, what's written in them, in what languages, and many other important questions. How did the books arrive here? Why these books are not others, and which books are absent? Books that I would expect to find in a synagogue, in a Jewish community and aren't here. And how come? Now, also we have to remember, these are only the surviving books. How many other books were the possession of the community and did not survive? For many reasons. Also, we have to remember, these are books that are in the synagogue, the public domain. What about personal households? Libraries such as my own in Jerusalem, or my parents' that have hundreds of books, they cannot be found in any synagogue. So what are, the, what are these books? Now, let's start with a simple question. What year is the book printed at? So what's the problem? Let's look at the front page and see, right? So there is a problem. I want to example. I want to give you one example. So you see this line? This is the year. Now, people who read Hebrew, can realize that this is not a year. These are Hebrew letters, that Hebrew words. And many times the words have to, are part of a phrase from the Bible that have to do with the content of the book. So these words are about glorifying the Lord, right? Glorifying God. And this, so, what's, so what's going on here? So as a researcher, I know that there is a concept of gematria, and some of you may have heard of, the numerical value of each Hebrew word. Let's say the first word of the alphabet, Aleph, is equal, equals to one. So if the word Aleph appears, I know, it's, I know to count it as one, and so on and so on. And after I get to the tenth letter, I start, start counting tens. The tenth letter is U, this ten, and then the following letter would be twenty until I get to reach a hundred. The ot kuf, the letter kuf. From the letter Kuf, I'm counting hundreds. So the following letter, Reish, would be 200. And since there are 22 letters, and 20, yeah, Kuf, Reish, Shin, Taf. So we have Kuf as 100, Reish, 200, Shin, 
300 and taf, right? 400, that's it, we can reach 400. So each word, each letter has a, has a numerical value. So I add them up, and then I have another problem, because the Hebrew year is not equal to the years that we count here. The Hebrew year now is not 2022. So I have to, so I'm realizing that I, I reached um, taf reish samich tet, when I combine the letters together. So, but taf reish samich tet, I know equals to 1909, okay? This, this book, sorry, this is 1909. This is Taf Reish Tet, 1849. This is a book from 1849. Now there's another thing you have to know, and I hope this interests you as much as it does interest me. You see, after the letters here, I'll just point with my finger. We have here three letters, Lamed Pei Gimel and Lamed Pei Kuf. So Lamed Pei Gimel means Leprat Gadol, and Lamed Pei Kuf means Leprat Katan, meaning we know that the Hebrew year is 5,000 and something. So some of the countings would include the 5,000, so they're telling you don't count the 5,000. We know about the 5,000, let's count the hundreds. So this is Prat Katan, saying forget about the, we know 5,000 is a given, okay? So I, I forgot about it, but here, you do have to take into consideration that one of the hay, hay is five, is for 5,000. So you see there's a hay with a dot on top of it. So this hay is hay, is hay alafim, is 5,000. So I know this is pat gadon and pat katan. So you see, there's a lot of work to only know what year was the book printed at. Um, now, where was the book printed? So. Many of the books were printed. We know that Jews here came from Iraq, from Baghdad, okay? So many of the books were printed in Baghdad, okay? This is a book from Baghdad. Po Baghdad, Yud Ayin Aleph, Yagen Alea Elohim, God shall protect Baghdad. A lot of times the cities had Yagen Alea Elohim. Uh, and here already we see some, some handwritings. We'll get to that, don't worry. Baghdad. Most of the books are from Baghdad. Many other books are from Livorno, Italy. Ooh, Italy, interesting. Why, why, why from Livorno? What's going on, okay? Already we have a question mark. And where else do you think, people who don't read Hebrew, where else would the books come from other than Baghdad and Livorno? England. England. Some came from England, you're right, right? Where else? Where did the Jews come before they came to Singapore? India. India, exactly. Calcutta, Mumbai, okay? This book is from Mumbai. Now, a lot of these books have very, they're very, they're valuable for the community. They have spiritual, they can teach us about the community. But if we're speaking about the why Jewish world, a lot of the books we can find in the, uh, uh, in the, National Library in Israel. Some books are very, very rare. And rare books many times come from places like India, okay? So this book is from Mumbai, and again, we have here the year. Sometimes they just put a dot on top of the letters to know which letters to count. Hidrachticha, shnat hidrachticha. You see here there's a big hay, leprat gadol, reminding you this is a large letter. Don't count the hay. The hay is for hay alafim. Okay, and so, so we're seeing the books coming from Italy, from India, from Baghdad, um, and from other places. Calcutta, this is the oldest book we have until now, 1840. Wow. Somebody was here to bring this book. I don't know exactly when, but this book was printed and brought from Calcutta. It was printed in Calcutta, not far, right? Not far, our neighbors uh, uh, from India, 1840. So probably from there, somebody brought this. Now what's interesting about this book, it's not a prayer book. Most of the books are books that you use in the synagogue. What do you use in the synagogue? You use the Bible, because you want to read the Bible on Shabbat, Monday, Thursday, the Tanakh, right? Uh, what else? We have Siduin, prayer books. What else? For Tisha B'Av? Haggadah shel Pesach, Pesach Haggadah. Um, you can think of many others. Slichot, right? 
so all of this we have, we have a lot. Pirkei Avot. We know there's a custom to say Pirkei Avot, part of the Mishnah, in certain months of the year, between Pesach to Shavuot, in certain communities. So they had a stock of Pirkei Avot. I can picture the Jews of Singapore sitting every Shabbat in a certain month of the year and giving, handing out the Pirkei Avot. And, no, this is not it. Or Shira Shirim, Shira Shirim. This is Shira Shirim. We have more than 10 of these. Shira Shirim. This is in Hebrew and Arabic. And, and Arabic. Okay, we'll speak about this. So, all of this is things that are rituals that are done in shul, in synagogue. But what about learning books, holy books that people learn in their home? So these are very, very interesting. And this is one of, this is Yosefus Flavius, the book of Yosefus Flavius. It's based on writings of Yosefus Flavius, Yosifun. It was translated from Latin. Uh, and here is a book from Berlin, and another book from Yerushalayim, from Jerusalem. Okay? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so uh, I'm looking at the book and I'm saying, why should a book that's from Jerusalem and that is not a prayer book, what is it doing here in Singapore? So I look at the book and I say, who wrote the book? So sometimes what's interesting is the content of the book, sometimes where it was printed, sometimes who wrote the book. And here I see someone called Eliyahu Yitzchak Chazan. So I look him up. And I, and I look in the book itself, and I see that one of the rabbis that was writing, a, writing like a, approving the book, was writing about Rabbi Yitzchak Chazan, and writing about him is the chief rabbi of Sin Shanghai. Okay? Oop. So he's writing about, so we know that he was a rabbi in Shanghai, in, in, in China. And he was, a rabbi in Hong Kong, in India, all of this I can, I can find out. And in the last years of his life, he came back to Jerusalem and wrote a book. So these are people that knew him. They knew him very well, and they owned his books, his writings. So I don't know how interested they were in these halachic, in this Jewish law book. I don't think that that was so interesting for the Jews in Singapore. They had the books of Rav Chazan. Okay, and Rav Chazan himself obviously came from Baghdad, okay? And he, he gets approvals also from rabbis from Baghdad. Rav Yaakov Chaim Sofer is a very well-known rabbi. He wrote, Perush, he wrote a commentary, Kafa Chaim. Very, very well-known. And he has Kabbalists here that are signing or giving approval to his book, Rav Uvad Yehadaya, Samech Tetz, Faradi Okay, this is, these are very, very important rabbis. Um, now I'm, I'm asking about the question between Livorno and Baghdad. So, what is the connection? We can see that many books were printed both in Baghdad and Livorno. Here, for example, we see it was printed in Baghdad um, in 1931. And it was uh, uh, taken from the hand of Shlomo B. Porti in Livorno. So somebody, uh, okay, got uh, the example of the book and printed it in Baghdad. We know there were Iraqi Jews. And, and here we see another book printed in Jerusalem that it is written, this book was printed several times in Baghdad and Livorno. So we already see what, I'm, what I want to tell you here that sometimes I have questions and the books themselves provide me the answers. I don't know something and then later I get, I reach to a, a, a later book and then I see, ah, Baghdad and Livorno, they had these connections. Not only that, I see there's somebody called David Chai Eini, and he's selling books in Calcutta. He lives in Calcutta. And this is, he also added his, uh, his, his image, right? He's a very impressive, very impressive Jew. And he says, he says, Ani Ish Nehardei, like it's from Babylon, from Iraq, right? Moledet Bavir. And I live in Kulkata, right? With Toshvei Kulkata, again, Alayloim, Dalet Chet, David Chai Eini, and then he writes, I want to tell you that we have, in this book printed in Calcutta, he's telling the readers, we have so many other things to offer. We have books from Livorno. We have Tzitziot. We have Mezuzot. We have so many things we can offer you. And here again, we have David Eini printing 
in Livorno. So we see these people were traveling and bringing with them not only opium and not only, I don't know, tea. They were bringing books and tzitzis and mezuzahs and sifrei Torah and they were selling them. And the people, the Jews of Livorno were extremely wealthy and they had these printing houses. And also they had Baghdadian Jews, in, Jews living there. And why do we need things from Livorno? Because both Jews in Livorno and Baghdad and India and Singapore, these Jews that came from Baghdad all spoke Arabic. And they needed prayer books that had Hebrew with Arabic. They needed this. They spoke Arabic. Some did not know English at all. Okay? And so we see. Somebody writes in another book about Hamedabrimbo be Baghdad ve India. That speaking Arabic in the cities of India and, and Baghdad. Another question is where. Who printed the book? And I was noticing that many times it's not only Baghdad, it's in a certain printing uh, house. Of someone called Dangu. Ezra Reuven Dangu. And here's a photo of him, also print in the book. And I don't know who this, because I, I, don't, I don't look up every person I come across. I'm now gathering the material. So who is this? Rav Dangu. One day after shul, after shachris, the, the morning prayer, I, there's very good breakfast, you should come. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in breakfast and I see someone from the community, a community member, and he says, my name is Josh, and I say, I'm Morty. And because I speak to everybody about the Geniza, because that's the only thing that I care about these days, <laughs> I said, you know, there's this amazing Geniza. Did you hear of it? And he said, no. And I said, you know, these books come from Baghdad. And he said, you know, my great-grandfather was from Baghdad. And he was the chief rabbi of Baghdad. So I said, well, you know, a lot of people exaggerate, not only because they want to, sometimes their families like to, right? <laughs> to, everybody wants to be the descendant of the king or the advisor of the king, right? Everybody are connected to this royalty. So I said, okay, probably he had, he's a descendant of a rabbi from Baghdad. I said, what's his name? So he said, I'm not sure you're going to know the name, but the name is Dangu. I said, you know what? Half of the books here, your great-grandfather printed. He was the chief rabbi of Baghdad. So we have here in the community, now Josh comes from Hong Kong. I think now they, they moved here. And he told me, you know, that my great-grandfather was also a rabbi in Burma, in Rangun, of Burma. Okay, we'll get to that also. So, these things also, these small miracles, keep happening. And when I look at the books, so we said, what year was it printed? Where was it printed? Also the name, sometimes they're like new books. We don't know as Jews. Who ever heard of the book Hadrat Skenim? Who ever heard of the book? Now there's another book called Adrat Skenim, but it's not this book. I'm looking at Adrat Skenim. It's a, somebody combined a lot of passages from the Zohar to be read at certain holidays or, or special days of the year. Um, and, and I look it up and, and I see it was printed in Bilpolti and I, I have, I can manage to reach the catalog of Bilpolti. And I find the book. I see it was really printed there, and I find the exact year. But then I see that I have here a special edition, a one-time edition. Now, this is, this is the book Adrat Kenim. This is not a special edition. We have here in the community several books of Hadrat Kenim. You can look at it carefully, OK, please. These, these are OK, very, very carefully. You can look at these books. You know what? Maybe you can even. This is one of the books. So, Hadratskini, but I see this book, somebody specific brought to print, and his name is Yitzchak Farhi. I say, who is Yitzchak Farhi? Because most of the Hadratskini don't have Yitzchak Farhi's name. It's just somebody decided to call the book Hadratskini. And, 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 and this time there was somebody that put in money to print this, and his name was Yitzchak Farhi, and I 
find out about him, and I find out that he was a Shadal, Shluchai the Rabbanan, he was a messenger from Israel, people who lived in Israel at the time, and did, they went around the world to collect money for Jews in Israel, from Tzfat, from Yerushalayim, from other cities, mainly from the holy cities, okay? And he also arrived in Italy that year, and we're speaking about 1851, okay? 1851. That the book I showed you is from 1851. Um, and then he continues on, and I find another book that his name appears. So when he was on his way back, a few months later, he went to Belgrade. And all of this I can know from looking at the books. I look at the front page and I see, ah, this is, this is just the following year. He was in Belgrade and he printed some of the Zohar, Sefer Tikkunim Shel Zohar. And then a year later he passed away in Israel. Now, I read about him and I read that he used to he used to share his books. He used to print books and give them out to communities. And that's why everywhere in the world we can find books of Yitzchak Farhi, this person. I'm sure he's happy now wherever he is to hear that we remember him. And I think now it's time to read the handwritings in the book. But the big question is, who can read the handwriting of Iraqi Jews? <laughs> and the answer is that even Iraqi Jews today would have a hard time to do so. I don't mean to offend them. <laughs> but many would admit that they, come, they descend from Iraq. And it's very hard. Why? Because the Iraqi, and not only the Iraqi Jews, this is called this a special handwriting, and when you look at it, it looks like Arabic. This is Hebrew. I know it's confusing. Now this, I took this chart from a thesis. I apologize, I'm gonna tell you later who this was. It slipped from my mind, this is important. I'll put in the comments of Facebook the name of who wrote this terrific thesis about, about this, okay? So you can all see the name and I'll I'll write the name of the thesis itself. Very good thesis. And this is called Ktav Rahut. Ktav Rahut, or Me'alak. Me'alak. In Arabic, it's hung. Where is it hung? From, from the line. There's the line where you write, and the letters are like hanging from the line, and they're combined together. And it's very, very difficult to read. So, I will, people who read Hebrew, I will challenge you and ask you, can you read what's written here? And let me answer for you. No. No. And I'm telling you this as someone that deciphered handwritings from the Middle Ages. I did this for several years, deciphering, and I, had, uh, I've, this, I still cannot decipher this fully. And I had to ask for help. And I approached Yaakov Rosen previous ambassador of Jordan, uh, of, his, of uh, the Israeli ambassador in Jordan, because he's an expert. And he's in touch with people like Rav Shabbat and Rav Zamir, the Iraqi Jews in Israel. And together, we're trying to decipher what's written here. And let's see. So we have here, so these are things from here, from Singapore. What do people write on the books? So you can probably guess. What do people write? They can write their names. They will write the death of their parents, the dates of the death of their parents. They would sometimes dedicate the book in honor of their parents, to, to remember their parents. Sometimes, this is interesting, they would write who they bought the book from and how much it cost. <laughs> and some, some additional, but those are most of the writings. So this is Ani, okay? Ani Hatsaid. Zion, Daniel, okay? Ani Atzair, Zion, Daniel. I'm not sure if this is Shisha, Sheshet. And then here it's Kaniti, I bought. I bought the book, Kaniti Oto. In Sparim Achirim, I bought it with other books. And then he writes the year, Shna Taf Reish Menchet, 1888. Okay, somebody writes 1888, he writes his name, he writes where he bought it from. 
And he wrote from who he bought it from? From someone named Ezra Meir Rachamim. Now, I don't know yet to tell you a lot about these people. I have tens and tens of names, dozens of people that I don't know yet about them, but I think we can discover in the future, okay? There's a lot of work that should be and can be done here. Or Zeha Sefer Lemenu. So this is just, uh, this is he's in his possession. But this book is Zeha Sefer Lemenuchat Hamanoach Hazaken Yechia Avraham Menashe. Somebody called Yechia Avraham Menashe. I found other books with his name. And it says when he passed away, Taf Reish Pei Zayin. Taf Reish Pei Zayin, 1927. Right? He's young, right? 1927. And Tan Seva, right? The Henish Matot Tzorah His soul should okay, rest in, uh, in peace. Forgive me for not uh, exactly translating this. And we have people writing the Yorzeit, the, the day of the year where the parents... So we have... And, and many times when we read this, it's Hebrew, but it's Arabic. It's Judeo-Arabic. Jews that write Hebrew letters, but the words are in Arabic. So even if I can decipher this, I don't understand what this means. Okay, let's say uh, um, we have here, so somebody writes about Yom Ptirat. I just got this Yom Ptirat, Abba, Abba Mori, uh, Shisha, Asar, Okay, and then he said, Ptirat. So we have to, we have to see who's, who passed and when did they pass. Or here, Hamanoach, Heine, Mazaken, Abba, Mori, Ima, Imi, Mazal Tov, Bat Simchav, and so on and so on. So people are, wi are writing the names of their parents and when they passed away. And sometimes they're dedicating, contributing the book in their, uh, in their memory. Now, many times, we don't know if the person who wrote what he wrote lived in Singapore. Maybe this person lived in Calcutta, wrote what he wrote, and later on it arrived here. So why am I even bothering? I'm just joking, right? <laughs> to decide for a person who's not Singaporean, right? I'm interested in the Jewish community of Singapore. So, many times, and this is very moving, I see the word Singapore. And then I know, without even deciphering the whole thing, this is something from the community. Can you spot the word Singapore? Found it? Right. Singapore. I know, uh, two other examples. Okay, Singapore. Singapore. Okay. Um, there are different names here. Eliyahu, Reuven, Ezra, Arazi, for instance. Now, the, sometimes the, the years would be written in, uh, in Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, uh, letters or uh, numbers, I mean, and words in Arabic. Sometimes we see people that have their... Uh, their names printed on the book itself, engraved. Hatzair, so we know it's already Eliyahu, Yosef, Aharon, Shlomo. Lakachti oto asefer b'mea shishim. And then he writes the amount of how much money he paid for it in the year Taf Reish Tetvav, 1856. More names, I don't know what to say about them, just I want you to see there's so many, I brought only a few. Yosef is Rashimon. Who are you? You tzadik vav. Yishmereu tzurov yechayehu. God, his creator, should protect him and give him life. I didn't know what is this until I realized that these three letters are the same and just they were turned around. It's not very common. It's not common at all to see this. So it would be tzurov yishmereu yechayehu. The same thing. Yishmereu tzurov yechayehu. I just realized this this week. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, other names. Moshe Chai Tzion. So here we have Tzion Chai Moshe. And then all of a sudden I see a stamp. Now this is a new level. When we have stamps. And the stamps tell us amazing stories. Let's say we see some stamps come from Penang, Jewish community. But this was owned by Aaron Menashe from Calcutta. This was for Penang Shul. 
Penang Kodesh Lashem Beit HaKnesset. Penang. Now, I think this is from Burma. I'm not certain, but I can read there, Beit HaKnesset, Kahal Kadosh, and we have Reish Nun Gimel. Now, we know there was a Jewish community in Rangun. So this makes a lot of sense, that this is from Rangun. We're, st we're still working on this. Property of Magen Avot, Talmud Torah, Hebrew school. So we have many and many of these that can teach us also so much. Or sometimes this was donated to a synagogue in Jerusalem in memory of Grace Balas by Jacob Balas, and then found its way back here. Some are obviously very recent, right? Um, so we have here, I'm just, I'm going through these that you can just have some more examples. Some are just uh, the stores that sold the books or the printing, the printing places, Singapore and Penang, and do you recognize this one? Our rabbi, Hadava Bergel, okay? Uh, and Rav Shababo, interesting story, not for now. Uh, also, uh, has, and he has another one, because I think he was here for about 27 years. When we were here so long, you have to have different stamps, right? You don't want to get bored. So, uh, Albert Lela, some of you might recognize some of the names, the families, this is another Rav Shababo. Okay, this is another Rav Shababo. Um, okay, some more examples. In memory of Abdullah Shuker, Singapore. Um, and sometimes you find books that reach here and belong to people from other places. This belonged to someone, I don't know who this is, Herman Bing from Frankfurt. A.M. Amain, right? Al Alamein. Herman Bing. And this is a stamp of somebody from Alexandria, Egypt. This is what's so amazing about Singapore. I don't think in any other place in the world you can find from so many remote places books. And this is the only books that remained in one synagogue in Singapore. Frankfurt, Alexandria. Who's this person? Who's this person? I'm looking at the name. I'm looking him up. I'm trying to find out some information. Who's this person? I found out that his name is Moshe Ratzabi from Alexandria. And he really, he, he also published some books in Egypt, 1901. So I know about, I know how to write about what, what, when this, when this book is, wh wh where is it from? When is it from? And now we have also the Judea Bank I was telling you about. So a lot of the books have Hebrew, and then Hebrew letters, but Arabic. Kol Israel, Kol Israel. I don't know Arabic, okay, forgive me. But some words I do know. Uh, and, and we have here Arabic, we, more Arabic, Shila Shirim. This is Shila Shirim with, uh, with uh, Judeo-Arabic in it. Uh, and sometimes you have Arabic writing. People wrote in Arabic. I can't read this. If anyone can, please contact me. I would love to, uh, to use your help. English is recent years, obviously. And Fernanda that is here is helping me with that. I'm not always so good with deciphering everything. And don't forget Ashkenazi, okay? Ashkenazi community members. I'm here for you. Uh, yes, so they were Ashkenazis. It's true that the, 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 the community here, the foundation is Iraqi. No doubt about that, but they were Ashkenazi. And some books came from uh, Ashkenazi uh, countries, and some had even Yiddish. Okay, this is a, this is a, um, a book, Chumash uh, Bamidbar. And uh, you can see it has uh, also Yiddish. Uh, now, if somebody sold the Yiddish book, it means somebody read the book, right? Somebody needed the Yiddish. Somebody used the Yiddish, right? Yiddish is like the German Jewish. So we have here Zontag, Montag, Dimstag, Mitvach, Donnerstag, Freitag, and Shabbat, okay? We have here, or so people here who know Yiddish can probably recognize a lot of, a lot of the words. So we have, we have here also the Ashkenazim and um, what, and we're, we're, we're heading to the end, okay? Now, 
because I do want to hear some comments and questions if you have. What, like, like I said, what is very fascinating is books that aren't used for prayer. What are the books rather than prayer books? Because this can teach us a lot about the community. Because they, they don't have a lot of these. Most of the books are prayer books. So the, the tiny percent of books that aren't prayer books, what did the Jews bring with them and study, I don't know, between prayer to prayer? Maybe they came early on Shabbat morning to learn with their kids. I don't know. We don't know. But obviously, a Jewish synagogue should have the halacha, right? Shulchan Aruch. Halachic book, the Jewish law. Choshen Mishpat. Okay, one of the Jewish, the Jewish law books, printed in Varsha, 1874. Uh, here's just like an apologetic uh, disclaimer that was customary to say that not all of the Goyim, the Gentiles, the non-Jews that are mentioned, because sometimes there are some unpleasant things regarding to non-Jews, so it's not the Jews of t non-Jews of today, it's the non-Jews those days. The non-Jews today are good non-Jews. Uh, but there, there's also, obviously, explanations for this uh, in terms of idolatry, people who believed in idolatry or did not. And, um, and here I see Mordechai and I think here the word Bombay, so Bombay, Ir Bombay, so we can also see there's writings on the book itself. What other books? Zoha. The community was very big on Zoha. The Kabbalistic most famous book, okay, the Zoha. Uh, so there are a lot of Zoha books. These are just a few examples of the Zoha printed in Baghdad by Rav Dangul, obviously. If I tell you Baghdad, you say Dangul. Dangul. Like that. And uh, okay, this is part of the Eid Razuta, Kinu uh, Sakatan, the small gathering. Um, this is part of, with the Lurianic uh, uh, commentary. Um, and this is another Zoha um, from Vilna. This very, very famous uh, uh, Rome uh, uh, publishing house. They published the uh, Babylonic Talmud that we have today. The Vilna Talmud is theirs. Uh, it's in Vilna, 1894, okay, um, so some more examples, I just brought Mishnah, another Zohar, and sometimes I was wondering, and now we're getting to the establishment of the state of Israel and Zionism, like, what was the approach of the Jewish community here? So, I don't have answers, I think a lot of the answers People have just interviewing people and asking, and the books don't give us all of the answers. But there is uh, some interesting things I noticed. One of them is, you see the Magen David here. Now, I didn't see any other pattern with Magen David from Livono except for this one that was printed 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel, Tavshin Chet. So other books, don't have this, but here we have them again. It doesn't say anything about it. It was in Singapore, but probably I'm sure the excitement of the establishment did not, uh, right, was also felt here. This Gatum again, a vote synagogue, and this is the uh, Israeli anthem, Hatikva, um, right? So Hatikva, and this book was printed uh, 1930. Hatikva became the anthem only 1933, I think. So, but still, this was uh, was sung and known as like a Zionist anthem, and we have it in one of the sing the, the poems and songs. There were some books of probably singing in Shabbat during the meals. So, one of the songs is also this one, and who knows, right? Maybe maybe they also uh, sang this. Um, and then we get obviously to things recent years. People who live here today in our community, that people continue to write on the books, their names, and other additional information or to, for their parents, right? And sometimes we can find, like, presented to David Marshall, 
a book that was given. <laughs> I don't know why he decided to leave it in the synagogue and not take it with him. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Uh, maybe it was just an accident. Um, and now I think after we looked at the books, it's time for me and Yossi to arrange them on the shelves. And this is a very exciting moment. There are some other shelves that didn't fit in, okay? But Yossi helped me, and by categories, we put them together on shelves in the synagogue. And there's still a few more boxes left, but all of a sudden you see books that, who even knew that existed? Who even knew they're here, where are they, what condition they are, and now all of a sudden they're getting life again. And a lot of people also are, but maybe before, just there are some challenges I want to finish with. Sometimes not everything can be read so easily, like these. You see the condition is not always so good. And sometimes you also need to leave the library and go out maybe to the cemetery and see if some of the names that me and you don't know and even people living today will not know to say anything about. Who are these people? But there are graves, I found the earliest grave from 1851 in the cemetery. So I'm sure some of the names can match, names we see on the books, so we can learn from that. Also, Fernanda joined me on this, on this journey. Um, so obviously there's still a lot to be done, to catalog, to scan, to decipher, to collect stamps, signatures, to write down stories. Every book has so many. I just gave you some minor examples, but there's so much to do and to recognize. And today, these are books from today. This is from Rav Rivni's office. Um, and I, I don't envy Morty that's going to come in like 200 years from Jerusalem. He's going to have so much work to do. He's going to be totally confused. It's just going to be overwhelming, right? Thousands and thousands of, even, even if one-tenth of the books survive, really, he's going to, we're, we're, the community is going to have to, to think already about what's going to be in, in, in hundreds of years from now. So much, so much uh, left, uh, so much left behind. Uh, I do want to conclude and say that from the minute that I started the community, all were very, very happy to help me. From the first mi moment, the rabbis, if it's Rav Rivni and Rav Abergel and Rav Nisim, just said, you have a free hand. You do whatever you need to do. We support you. We're with, we're with you. And it can be others that approached me and helped me if it's in so many ways, we have here Professor Tamash that's here with us, thank you, and Professor McConaughey that's watching us now, and Fernanda from NTU, and Yossi and Ben Benjamin, and Ariel Kohelet that's going to help to preserve the physical books, to help preserve them. Uh, um, and really, everyone I came across, there's so many, helped so much. So this is thanks to you. And there's still a way to go. A lot of stories that I didn't tell you, so please, if you can, join me on January uh, 18th. Thank you. You are always welcome to contact me um, all over. Uh, I was even thinking of maybe having like a weekly Geniza. <laughs> I don't know if it's too much, but if you want, you can WhatsApp me. You can like take a photo and WhatsApp me. And if I see there are people interested, I'll happily... Uh, send a weekly WhatsApp with maybe a, a book with some, something about it. These are also some things that I do if you want to hear me speaking about Israel. Uh, and it was, thank you for coming. It was a pleasure and I'm here to, for any questions. Thank you for watching.